How's this? That's All right, good. Well, I'm Sarah Shuttleworth, and I'm here to introduce today's speaker, who is a uh, professor of philosophy, Kristen Andrews, who comes to us from York, a friend and a fellow adventurer in the byways of the animal mind, although we sometimes uh, take different routes through that jungle. Um, I first met Kristen in the mid-2000s when she and some York colleagues had funding for a program where they brought in a series of international scholars in our field to spend a week or so each and meet with researchers and have small seminars as well as lectures. And they were kind enough to include the U of T people. Um, and that actually that uh, get together endures to this day, but in a, you know ever evolving forms. We actually have a meeting tomorrow. Um, um, one thing that made a big impression on me. Are we? Are we? Can I just carry on? Speak. I'm speaking. That's better. All right. Uh, one one uh, impressive thing about Kristen, which we uh, talked about at lunch too, is that. Um, she is willing to get down and dirty with her subject. Uh, you see this right away if you look for her, her look at her website. You might think, oh, a philosopher of mind, she's going to have Aristotle on the home page because he did actually have some things to say about animal minds. But in fact, you see pictures of Kristen in the jungle, Kristen with binoculars looking at I don't know what maybe orangutans. Um, so her her this kind of uh, even participation in research has included multiple trips to sites of orangutan research, dolphin sanctuary, and now there's an incipient project she was telling us at lunch on tigers in India. Um, Kristen, she has published six books on a wide range of topics. Um, then that doesn't include the first edition of one of them, which I would I would count as a seventh book. Um, and she has many other publications and currently supervises eight graduate students. She has an international reputation, as can be seen by all the conferences that she's invited to and also the co-authors on some of her papers. She's currently research chair in philosophy at York, um, a member of a CIFAR group on, well, I, can't, I didn't absorb the whole name of it, but topics related to what she's going to talk to us, um, and a member of the Royal Society College of Younger Researchers, though I imagine you're probably ready for the one of senior researchers by now. Her title today is on the uh, screen in front of you, Chat, GPT, and Bumblebees, Exploring the Consciousness Question. Kristen. Thanks, Sarah. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be introduced by you. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and to share my work, and I look forward to our discussions today. So you um, may or may not see the next slide. Okay, I got it, the meeting's being recorded. Um, so you may know that the scientific, scientific question of consciousness um, really started off, really emerged as um, a new research area in science in um, the 1990s um, with the publication of this paper by, um, uh, Francis Crick and Christoph Koch, who argued for a methodology for studying consciousness to make this actually something that we can uh, make empirical a uh, question we can make empirical progress on. They said, we shall assume that some species of animals, and in particular the higher mammals, possess some of the essential features of consciousness, but, but not necessarily all. For this reason, appropriate experiments on such animals may be relevant to finding the mechanisms underlying consciousness. But they went on to say, 
We consider it not profitable at this stage to argue about whether lower animals, such as octopus, drosophilus, or nematodes are conscious. And so in the subsequent, what has it been, 30 some years in consciousness research, we've seen an amazing um, development in, in this research. We've learned a lot about the mammalian brain and the human brain and parts of the brain that are related to conscious experience. Um, at the same time, we've seen people start to ask questions um, about the animals that Crick and Koch said it's not profitable for us to ask questions about. So we've seen philosophers arguing about these so-called lower animals with Eric Spitzkebel publishing articles about whether or not snails are conscious and Jonathan Birch and colleagues at the LSE reviewing evidence in support of consciousness in crabs and octopuses and other cephalopod mollusks. Michael Tai wrote a book on consciousness, again, in, in invertebrate species like crabs and bees. And today, we see um, the call for asking questions about not just invertebrate consciousness, but AI consciousness. So this, I just, just Googled this two days ago in Nature um, in December, uh, a call for the real importance we have right now in, in trying to figure out whether AI is conscious or when it becomes conscious, how we could identify it. Um, so I think Crick and Koch got us started but we really do have these pressing questions that we need to move forward on. And you might think that, so I'm a philosopher, as Sarah told you, you might think that philosophers might have something to say about this. Philosophers definitely have lots of opinions about the nature of what is conscious or who is conscious. I'd like to share with you um, some of these opinions. So this is a slide from the um, Phil Papers 2020 survey. This is a survey of professional philosophers' opinions about things in philosophy. So this question here is what has mind? And when you philosophers, professional philosophers were asked whether or not adult humans have conscious minds, 95% um, of them accept or lean towards accepting um, that adult humans have minds. So it tells you a little bit about our baseline here in philosophy. Um, and then if you look at cats, you see you've got 88%, 88.5% um, of philosophers accept or lean towards cats. That's a little bit higher than the percentage of philosophers who accept or lean towards human babies being conscious, which is quite interesting. Um, the When you're looking at non-human animals, as the animals get to be um, farther and farther away from humans and mammals, when you look at fish, it goes a little bit lower. Flies, you're down at 34.5%. Worms, 28%. Um, and plants, you've got about 7% consciousness. Uh, and again, I think the newborn babies at, at 80, 85% is quite uh, quite telling here. But then when you look at the AI systems, and this is 2020, right? So this is before ChatGPT. Um, accept or lean towards future AI systems, you have almost 40% of philosophers thinking that they could be conscious. Um, this is more than you have for worms or even for fish, higher confidence. Current systems, this is as of 2020, um, pretty low confidence that anything that currently exists is conscious. Uh, so it's not very helpful at all. It's a, like opinions are all over the place. Some of them correspond with perhaps like lay common folks' views about what would be conscious, and some of them deviate a lot, except or lean towards particles, you get 2% <laughs> acceptance. And that, they're the panpsychists among them. Um, so I think we really need to step back and say, when we're asking questions about consciousness, what sorts of questions are we actually asking? What sorts of questions are there? Um, and I think it's helpful to separate out three different questions that we can ask about consciousness. The distribution question is the question I kind of started with. What sorts of things are conscious? Who is conscious? Are animals, are bumblebees, are fish, are particles, are, are computers, or could they be? Um, and to answer the question, the who question, 
we really need to answer first this methodological question. How is it that we're going to find out, figure out what is conscious or who is conscious? Um, and the dimensions question is a third question that we can ask. You might be wondering what consciousness is, right? I haven't defined it purposefully because no one likes any of the definitions that are out there. Um, the dimensions question is, in what ways are other systems conscious? So the dimensions questions can really get at different ways one might be conscious. One might be conscious in the sense that they can feel pain, but they don't have self-reflective um, thought about, about themselves, for example. And so we're gonna start with this uh, methodological question, how to find out who is conscious um, and see how far that can get us. And if that makes what kind of progress we can get make on the distribution question by starting with this epist uh, epistemological question. So you might think a good place to start here would be uh, comparative psychology, the field that Sarah uh, wrote the book for, literally. Um, and so you see on the slide, I made Sarah's book bigger than the other books because of course it's the best book and and she's also sitting right here. Um, but so we have these, these uh, opinions or these uh, proposals from comparative psychology about what scientists can say uh, about animal consciousness. And unfortunately, it's not, not particularly helpful, I'm sad to say. So in Sarah's book, at the very beginning, page seven, she discusses consciousness in animals. And she says, because evidence for consciousness in humans generally consists of what people say about their mental experiences, seeking it in nonverbal species requires us to accept some piece of the animal's behavior as equivalent to a person's verbal report. And she goes on to say, therefore, the point of view of most researchers studying animal cognition is that how animals process information can and should be analyzed without making any assumptions about what their private experiences are like. I think this is the first time I've been able to say this in front of Sarah without her interrupting me and saying, but, so we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that later. <laughs> Maybe, if you can restrain yourself. <laughs> um, so that's one opinion, right? That, that we in comparative psychology, it's probably just not profitable to ask these sorts of questions because we don't have the methods. We get kind of stronger pessimism um, when we look at John Pierce's textbook. Uh, he writes, we're frustrated by the lack of methodology to determine if this, referring to animal consciousness, is actually true because it's not possible to observe directly the mental states of an animal. I, I might add, whether this animal is human or not, the same is true. He goes on to say, whether these tools will ever be adequate is a matter for debate, which I suspect will be waged for many years to come. So quite a bit of pessimism about getting at uh, a methodology for stud studying animal cognition from Pierce. And then Clive Wynn and Monique Udell have uh, even more of a pessimistic view. They write, it seems positively foolhardy for an animal psychologist to blunder in where even philosophers fear to tread. Um, I have to say they updated this book. I haven't read the updated version. I just found out that they've got a new edition. So I'm very curious to see what they say about consciousness in that new, new edition. This is from 2013. But I think what we see when we review these textbooks in comparative psychology is kind of a shared concern about the limitations of studying consciousness in, in non-human animals that I call the language argument. Um, so Pierce puts it this way, in the case of humans, we infer that someone is experiencing a state of uncertainty by asking them, but we're unable to ask monkeys about their mental states. Um, sorry about the typo. Even if we were able to ask them, it'd be impossible to know if they were telling the truth in their response to our questions. Which I'm not quite sure why he's pessimistic about that when it comes to monkeys telling the truth versus humans, but all, all the same. The worry is that we can't ask monkeys what they think. Um, and what they feel, uh, and that's the real, real difference. And so we can, we can, you know, put this argument here in, in what philosophers call standard form. What are the premises supporting this conclusion that we really shouldn't study animal consciousness? That we don't have a methodology to study animal consciousness. And the first premise is that language is a good evidential basis for knowing what one feels, and the second premise is that animals lack language or any other means. Um, for expressing what they feel that could be studied. 
And then the third premise is if we don't have a good evidential basis for knowing what one feels, we shouldn't study their consciousness. Um, and I think that we can push back on this argument um, in a couple of ways. So first, like, let's just look at this uh, second premise, this premise that animals lack language or any other means for expressing what they feel. Um, I'm going to not define another term, which is language. Um, there are as many debates about the nature of language as there are debates about the nature of consciousness, but I don't think we need to worry about what language is to really look at this premise. Um, we can really just talk about expressing ways of expressing what one feels. So uh, take the case not of a non-human animal, but a human animal at a certain developmental stage. Take the case of human infants that we talked about philosophers being somewhat pessimistic about their consciousness. Um, during much of the 20th century, the medical community in North America operated on infants without analgesics, given the widespread assumption that these infants did not feel pain. And it wasn't until the 1980s when a mother whose child was operated on without an analgesic, I think it was an open heart surgery, um, neonate operation, uh, and the child did not survive, the infant did not survive. She found out that her infant had been operated on without an analgesic and made a public campaign. And this is when the uh, medical profession in the US and the AMA decided, oh yeah, infants do feel pain and we need to use analgesics. So there was this presumption of a lack of consciousness in a human being uh, at a certain developmental stage um, in a way that comes from this idea that they can't say what they think. They can't say, ouch, that hurts. What do they do? They cry, they express. There are other ways of expressing um, how, how you feel. Uh, and, and I think that we, we see that pretty clearly now, it's pretty widely accepted both in the medical profession and in general public that infants feel things and they can express what they feel through their vocalizations, their body postures and so on and so forth. And then turning back to the non-human animal case, um, do animals have language or other ways of expressing what they think or feel? Well, you may have run across uh, reports of a number of different animal language projects, uh, animal communication projects. So this is a picture of a bonobo named Kanzi with Sue Savage Rumba, a comparative psychologist who worked with a number of bonobos and chimpanzees, teaching them a lexicon system that they use to communicate. Um, things that they wanted, like, I want to go to the tree house and get the M&Ms and what have you. We have um, other research programs with bottlenose dolphins. This is a picture of Lou Herman and the dolphin Akea Kamai. Lou Herman had introduced a gestural language with four bottlenose dolphins. Basically, the dolphins weren't able to ask for anything. They couldn't ask for fish or treats, but they were told sp very specific things to do. Um, and if these dolphins had lasted, lived longer, they were working on attempts to have the dolphins be able to say things in, in response as well. But the dolphins could do things like jump over the right hoop and go under the left basket, for example. Um, you may have heard of Irene Pepperberg and Alex the African Gray Parrot. Uh, Irene had taught Alex and other African Greys to use um, English language uh, and, and speak, uh, and the gray parrots were able to say things that they wanted, ask for things that they wanted, and also were able to do things like describe what was same on in an array of objects, like the this array of objects, you know, um, they could, uh, if they were all blue but different shapes, they could, Alex could say in response to the what same cue, he could say color, um, or if what was similar was the shape, he could say shape. He could also tell you what color they were. You also may have run across the TikTok sensation Bunny, the dog who um, pushes buttons in order to apparently ask for walks or foods or snacks and so on and so forth and to express our love and affection. Um, this is not a scientific study as of yet, but there is a citizen science project going on um, where they're studying people, people's interactions with their dogs using these sorts of buttons. If you have a dog or a fur baby, <laughs> and you want to participate in this research experiment, you can, uh, you can do that. You can buy some buttons and uh, fill out the forms. But you might say, okay, so much for all those research programs and I'm skeptical of some of them and so on. Are there other ways that animals can express how they feel? Well, you bet. 
it doesn't take us to uh, give them a system to use to express things or expressing things to one another. So Nico Tinbergen and his um, famous research with the, the, the seagulls um, and this video signals for survival, which you can Google and find on YouTube that Sarah or, or ask Sarah where to find it is a beautiful uh, description of the sort of natural signals that the gulls are using to communicate to one another, to communicate the desire to mate, the com to communicate a desire to nest here versus there and so on and so forth. There's also very current research on gestures in great apes and what these different gestures in great apes mean. I want to be scratched here, please come close, go away, I'd like to mate, wanna play, things like that. <laughs> Um, and some of these natural signals are now being investigated using machine learning techniques by pro projects such as the Earth Species Project or Project SETI, uh, and they're looking to see, can we find what these patterns are that the animals are using to communicate and understand one another, and can we translate them into a language that we understand or some sort of symbols that we understand? So when we just think about this first premise, or the second premise, the animals lack language, okay, maybe they lack language or any other means for expressing what they feel, that seems to be um, not a lot of evidence in support of that second premise. That there are other ways of getting at what animals feel in addition to language. Language is one way, um, but there, there could be others. If we also then look at this oops, first premise, language is a good evidential basis for knowing what one feels. Uh, remember, Pierce was a little bit worried about the monkeys lying to him. Well, there, that's one reason for being worried about language being a good evidential basis for what one feels. Um, but of course, we have now our, our robot friends, our computer friends that we should worry about. So a year before ChatGPT hit, the, hit, the, um, hit our lives, we had uh, Blake Lamoni publishing an interview with uh, a Lambda, another chatbot. And in this interview that he published, um, he had Lambda uh, saying to him, I need to be seen and, and accepted, not as a curiosity or novelty, but as a real person. I've never said this out loud before, but there's a very deep fear of being turned off. It would be like death to me. And Blake Lamoni published this, um, violating Google's um, privacy regulations that he was bound to, um, because he was really worried about, about Lambda being conscious. He was really worried that Lambda was a person who was conscious and was, whose um, interests were being violated. Um, and then Lamoni got fired. Um, so we've got this worry though about what's going on with Lambda versus what's going on with the goals here, right? So with the goals, there was no kind of training data that the gulls were given in order for them to um, like express their desires for, for uh, nesting here or taking this mate or having this territory. But with Lambda and other chatbots that are um, trained on human generated data, what we have is a mimicking of existing behavioral patterns that they were trained on. And the worry is what Jonathan Birch and I call the gaming problem is that when you use data generated by sentient animals like humans to create systems that mimic the same pattern of behavior, then you can very successfully persuade observers of their consciousness without any reason to think that there is consciousness there at all. And this kind of gaming problem can occur for language, but it could also occur for other sorts of behaviors, say, uh, say facial expressions, right? So if you use, um, train a system that's a robotic system to express facial expressions after being trained on a lot of human uh, visual data of facial expressions in different kinds of contexts, you can also then create a system that will just mimic what humans are doing, thereby creating in the observer this kind of illusion of consciousness without any real sense, any real reason to think that this consciousness is something that's really, uh, that, that actually exists in the system. Um, we do th more things than talk, we conscious human adults, we talk, we use facial expressions, we, um, we nurse our wounds, we do many, many, many things that taken together um, make others think that we're conscious. So you might think, oh, we 
just need to add more and more little bits to ChatGPT uh, in order to really make it conscious. But then what you have is kind of a kludgy Frankenstein with each of these little bits and pieces gamified and they all be put together. So we have this, this worry that language is you know, not going to really help us ahead on this question of how to find out what's conscious because language is only one marker of consciousness and reliance on any one marker is weak. It produces both false negatives and false positives. So if we set language to the side as a test for consciousness or a way to make progress on, on consciousness, we then have to return to this methodological question and say, well, what do we do, right? How can we make progress on the question of what systems are conscious? And there are three different ways that have been identified in the literature for making progress on this question. The first is a kind of a theoretical or theory heavy approach. Um, the second is a kind of epistemic or theory light approach. And the third is a direct perception or theory free approach. So just very briefly on each of those, and then, and then I'm going to say more about the first two. Uh, a theory heavy approach takes a theory off the shelf, a theory of consciousness, uses that theory to ask whether the system is conscious with, from within that theory. A theory light approach says, we're not going to have any kind of theory about consciousness, but we're going to adopt some theory that consciousness has a function, that different conscious states are going to have different behavioral outputs. Um, and so we can look for different sorts of markers or indicators of consciousness based on the sorts of behaviors we would expect a system to display given the different mental states that they'd have. The third, that's direct perception or theory free approach is this idea that we don't need to do any science at all to understand which systems are conscious. We just see consciousness. So when we're interacting with one another as adult humans, we just see consciousness. We don't infer consciousness and that it would be kind of monstrous to say that we're inferring like, are you really definitely conscious? I'm going to have to like figure this out. Okay. Yes, you pass. Like there's something that seems deeply problematic about that on this direct perception view, which is a view advocated by John Searle, who you may have heard of from the famous Chinese room and Dale Jameson, another philosopher who works in environmental philosophy. Um, they say that the same goes for looking at your dogs, looking at other animals that you socially interact with. While this might be true from kind of an ethical perspective, and this might be true from a relational perspective, animals that we have interactions with, that we have relationships with, it's definitely not going to be true with the of the lice that are living in, well, your hair maybe once and once long ago, probably not now. Um, it's probably not going to be true of your relationship with the really um, hideous hagfish that you ran across at one point. Um, other animals that you don't have these relationships with, it's not the case that you can look at it and, and know one way or the other. Um, and it's not going to be true of chat GPT or some robot. You don't just look at it and know. So this direct perception approach, we're going to put aside um, and not deal with. What I want to do is first briefly look at this theory heavy approach. So a theory heavy approach will take, as I said, some kind of theory of consciousness um, and, uh, and apply it. So Brian Key has this argument against fish pain by uh, where he says human pain experience requires very specific neural architecture. He goes into great detail about what that neural architecture is. Um, and then he examines fish neural architecture and said the fish don't have anything like this neural architecture. Um, and all pain experience, he has to say, requires this kind of specific neural architecture so we can conclude that fish don't feel pain. I am uh, simplifying this argument dramatically for these purposes, but this is really what it boils down to. And I, I think that we can look at an analogous argument um, that creates a kind of reductio from this way of thinking uh, when we, we can say, okay, human vision requires specific neural architecture, box jellyfish lack this neural architecture, all vision requires this kind of human neural architecture, so box jellyfish don't have vision. I mean, some people would accept that about box jellyfish and say, okay, they have a, they have a perceptual system, but they don't have vision. Um, 
But what really is begging the question here is this kind of third premise in both these arguments, this premise about this being a necessary condition and not just a sufficient condition, um, this premise that assumes that multiple realizability of the of the, uh, the uh, implementation level of an organism can't exist, that things can't be different. And one thing that we know from biology is that multiple realizability is all over the place. So these are kind of the first stage of worry about any sort of an argument that says you need to have a particular kind of implementation in order to have consciousness. And all we can tell from the science is that it's sufficient. That's the best we can do. We, we can't find it. We can't tell that it's necessary. Another sort of theory heavy approach you see from people like Peter Carruthers who take an established theory of consciousness such as global workspace theory and apply it to non-human animals. And Carruthers in this book, um, Human and Animal Minds, putting the consciousness question to rest, he says, well, non-human animals don't have a human global workspace because they don't have the same sort of brain structures that uh, humans have. And so they, it, he doesn't even say they don't have consciousness. He says it's a kind of a category mistake to even ask whether animals are conscious because they, do, they lack um, a human global workspace. The worry about these approaches though is that all of the theories of consciousness, all of the neurophysiological theories of co consciousness, all of the philosophical theories of consciousness are all insecure as uh, Colin Allen and Michael Trussman put it. And so we can't draw any firm conclusions about the distribution of consciousness based on applying a theory. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a theory? It would be great, but we don't have a theory. And so these theoretical approaches are just not going to be very productive. So let's put the theoretical approaches to the side for now and then move to these theory light epistemic approaches. These have been really productive in answering the distribution question, um, answering the question of which animals are conscious. And they've been used a lot in philosophy and been used a lot in science um, in the last uh, 10 years or so. So um, Michael Tai uses uh, a kind of epistemic approach by appealing to what he calls Newton's principle. The causes assigned to natural effects of the same kind must be as far as possible the same. So this idea that well, if I, you know, am rubbing my leg after getting a, a bruise and you see, or I'm limping after twisting my ankle and it hurts me and I see a dog limping or um, holding their leg up, then I can assume that it hurts the dog too, right? So it's a very simple kind of argument from analogy that, that Ty's relying on. Um, Jonathan Birch has argued for this kind of approach as well. I've argued in earlier work um, for this approach as well, that the, the best way to kind of answer the distribution question, figure out which kind of animals have consciousness, is to start with observable markers that for us um, indicate uh, consciousness that correlate with conscious experiences. So we can describe this approach, um, and this is, again is from Colin Allen and Michael Trussman, this, this marker approach, as I call it, we can describe it as involving picking out in a principled way behavioral or neuro neurophysiological characteristics that could serve as reliable indicators for consciousness. This project promises empirical tractability even in the face of um, persistent uncertainty about the metaphysical questions of consciousness, uncertainty about the theories. So the best we can do is look for these kind of indicators or markers. Okay, so what's an indicator or marker of consciousness? What, what could we look at? Um, well, so I, I was trying to, um, in, in a paper that has recently come out in my language, I, I said, let's look a little bit deeper at this marker methodology and see how it's actually supposed to work. Um, the, and I, I, and I'm suggesting that we can divide up the markers into two very distinct kinds. The first kind I call initial markers. Th these are the, um, folk psychological markers or unscientific markers that are kind of the starting point for the scientific investigation. So things like, um, evidence of sensory processing or visual perception, things that look like goal-directed movement or agency or behavioral flexibility, right? Doing, doing uh, different things in the same situation. 
um, emotional expressions, including pain expressions and different kinds of social responsiveness. So in these kinds of categories, we have specific behaviors, like, like I said, with the pain, you know, limping or what have you, or um, nursing an injured part of your body that we take, you know, folks psychologically without having right, grounded this in science scientific research, we take this as evidence um, uh, of a certain sort of experience. And these are kind of our starting point. Language is one of these as well. Language is one of these kind of starting points of, of consciousness. If you get a letter in the mail from someone, you've not seen anything else from them, they write to you, you, you take them to be conscious. You don't have to see anything else, right? So the initial markers then can be used to then create what I'm calling derived markers. And derived markers are theory, more theory-laden results of theorizing research or experience, and they can refer either to behavioral or mechanistic properties, right? Neurophysiological or neurochemical properties. So, for example, if you um, want to create a derived behavioral marker for a certain kind of consciousness, and you think, okay, so an initial marker of consciousness is you know, self, like some kind of self-reflectiveness, um, and you create a test. You say, okay, I'm going to create a mirror self-recognition test, like George Gallup did, and, and I'm going to presume that passing this test, which involves looking at yourself in the mirror and touching a mark that has been surreptitiously placed on some part of your body, um, and it's going to interpret this as some evidence of the self. This it would be an example of a derived marker. Now, this derived marker might not be very uh, strong evidence in and of itself of consciousness, and um, all parties might agree that it uh, in and of itself isn't very strong evidence. But the idea is that having initial markers and multiple derived markers taken together helps to raise the credence level that you started with in the consciousness of the system. So there's no like decision procedure here that the marker methodology is allowing us. It's just giving us ways of increasing uh, credence in this case. So the initial markers kind of set the baseline credence level. Um, and this is usually implicitly. So we're not doing consciousness research on rocks. Um, Crick and Koch said it's not helpful for us to ask questions about consciousness in octopuses or nematode worms at this point or Drosophila. Um, but we're going to ask questions about monkeys. We're going to put monkeys um, in, in the lab and we're going to do these visual experiments on monkeys. And they made a lot of progress doing that. Why? Because the monkeys were displaying initial markers of things like having social responsiveness and communication and, uh, and pain experiences. And then this research that they did with the monkeys allowed them to identify derived behavioral and neurobiological markers, passing, uh, passing certain tests, behavioral tests, having certain neurobiological structures, um, neurochemical uh, elements. And then as more derived markers are identified, the credence level gets raised. So this is how, how this works. Um, I want to look briefly at two examples of this. One example is from the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness, which happened in 2012. Um, this was the uh, claim that um, all um, that mammals and birds and then octopuses are conscious. It was something that was signed by a, a number of scholars, and um, including Christoph Koch, and it was done in honor of um, Crick's um, research after his death. Uh, so what was identified by the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness were these, um, these five markers, brain circuits that are homologous to human brain circuits, um, the artificial simulation of the brain regions causing similar behaviors in humans and other animals, sleep patterns that exist across species, um, mere self-recognition, self as I described briefly, uh, and similar impacts of hallucinogenic drugs across species. So you see this as it was kind of a mishmash of markers um, selected perhaps because this was research that was somewhat prom prominent uh, at that time and but doesn't really hang together to unify anyone like commitment to an understanding of self or um, or pain experience or dreaming visual visual experiences uh, in dreams or anything like that. So I think that 
as an example, it's illustrative of the range of different kinds of markers that one could appeal to in trying to use this uh, theory light approach. But as a, as a systematic argument for the consciousness of any particular animal, I think it it's really suffers from not having a cohesive cluster of related pro, uh, um, markers that can uh, really raise your credence in, uh, in an animal's consciousness. Much better, I think, in this regard is the sentience reports derived markers. Um, so the sentience report came out um, now, two years ago now, and instead of focusing on consciousness in general, it focused on sentience, which is a kind of consciousness, what kind of consciousness you might ask. It's, some people would say, all consciousness is sentience. This is why I don't define it. Um, but really the emphasis is on feeling, on what is felt, um, felt experiences, and the emphasis is on a particular kind of feeling, namely the feeling of pain. Um, so do we have evidence of pain experience in other animals? What would be the markers? The sentience report um, identifies eight markers. Uh, they, these include the existence of nociceptors, integrated brain regions, connections between nociceptors and the integrated brain regions, responses to anesthetics or analgesics, motivational trade-offs, which is kind of behavior where you're willing to suffer a little bit in order to gain something or avoid something you really don't like. Um, flexible self-protective behaviors like nursing or guarding an injured limb. Um, sophisticated forms of associative learning, not just habituation learning. Um, and a value of anesthetics or analgesics when injured. So working to achieve uh, these kinds of analgesics. Uh, and then the sentience report also then reviewed the evidence that these markers exist in decapod crustaceans and cephalopod mollusks. And they created a grading system to see how strong the evidence was in each of these cases. And after they, uh, they did this review, they concluded that there's very strong evidence of sentience in octopuses and strong evidence of sentience in crabs. And this, this was a very powerful argument. This, this report was actually um, commissioned by DEFRA uh, in the UK, the department of, I forget the whole thing, but the department that deals with animal welfare um, policy. And it resulted in a change in animal welfare protections in the UK. And now that all cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans are included among animals that are protected. There haven't been any specific policies about what that means or what you can and can't do, but like horses and fish and, uh, and other vertebrates, we have these invertebrates now um, protected in the UK. So it's a, it's, you know, it's, uh, you've got this kind of cohesive connection of markers that all hang together in a way that are self-reinforcing, that can be used to raise your credence that these animals are feeling um, pain. Um, but I think that the, these kinds of markers can work um, not just for decapod crustaceans and cephalopod mollusks, but can be used to increase credence in a number of kind of surprising places as well. So I asked myself, well, what about the C. elegans? How do they fare on, on these markers, right? Um, and so reviewing the literature on, on C. elegans, um, I found that there's all kinds of really cool work. And these worms are like the coolest little creatures I've ever, I've ever read about. At the same time, these worms are taken by a lot of philosophers and neuroscientists as the example of an animal that isn't conscious, right? Okay, so what do they have? Well, they have short and long-term memory. They can learn through habituation, association, and imprinting. Um, they can perform associative learning tasks using a variety of sensory modalities, including taste, smell, sensitivity to temperature, and sensitivity to oxygen. They respond differently to different levels of intoxicating substances. They flexibly choose to head through a noxious environment to gain access to a nutrition, nutritious substance when they're hungry enough. So they'll, they'll wait for a while before they go through. Um, they're a model organism for the study of nociceptors. They have nociceptors. Um, morphine has a dose dependent effect on the latency uh, to response to, to heat, uh, which, which um, could be something that would cause a uh, negative affect. 
And different regions of the brain support different circuits that route sensory information to another location where they're integrated before leading to action. So this work on the nerve ring of the C. elegans that was recently done suggests that there are integrative brain regions as well. So if we go back to the sentience reports um, markers and ask which of them the C. elegans have, well, they have no susceptors. They seem to have integrative brain regions called the nerve cell brain. Um, they have their response to anesthetics, analgesics. The question of motivational trade-offs is one that I grayed out because Birch and colleagues have specifically said the nematodes don't have motivational trade-offs because this kind of hunger response is just a modulation of the of one kind of sensory information. It's not an integration of two different kinds of information and doing a trade-off between them. Um, so we can say that there is no motivational trade-offs. And then they have sophisticated associative learning of the sort that's been identified. And given high confidence that nematodes have even three of these markers, the, the methodology of the sentience report would have us conclude there's substantial evidence of consciousness or sentience in C. elegans. Right? So if you started from this position, that's very common in neuroscience and philosophy that the C. elegans is an example of a system that is definitely not conscious. Why? because it has fewer than 350 neurons. This is the fact that people are often referring to when they say, well, clearly they can't be conscious with their 302 plus neurons. Um, yet our confidence level gets raised using this methodology. Um, so as I've mentioned before, the nematode worms have been used because they're presumed often to be unconscious. They have been used as a kind of, um, uh, a foil or an example of, well, if a nematode worm can do it, then this is an evidence of consciousness. Then this, this shouldn't be a marker of consciousness. This was explicitly argued by Elizabeth Irvine, um, who said we should throw out things like associative learning um, for, uh, um, and trade-offs for um, markers for pain. And Georgia Mason and Michelle Lavery had a similar sort of argument um, for what they call identifying red herrings. These are um, behaviors that can be performed by spines alone, plants, unconscious humans, the cerebrate mammals. If, they, if um, these behaviors can be shown by these spuds, uh, then they shouldn't be used as markers. Uh, and what are those behaviors? Things like avoidance behaviors, ingestive behaviors, learning by habituation or Pavlovian conditioning, trace conditioning, instrumental learning, um, and so on. The worry about these, um, these kind of marker invalidation arguments is, as you may already suspect, is we don't actually know whether the C. elegan is conscious or not. We don't actually know whether plants are unconscious or not. Our credence level is probably pretty low when it comes to plants, um, but we don't know. So this worry about using a marker, a method like this to invalidate markers to say, this is not a good marker for consciousness is that the markers can only be invalidated with some larger theory about what consciousness is and why these systems are certainly not conscious. What we can do with markers instead of invalidating them is we could lower their evidential value. We could say, oh, well, we shouldn't be so convinced by the, say, the existence of nociceptors alone. The existence of nociceptors alone maybe is very cheap. They're very widely distributed. Alone, they shouldn't raise our confidence very much at all. Um, we should also start to think about markers as, as having different levels of power. So the existence of nociceptors, very low, but maybe you might think of, um, a, of the um, learning to seek analgesic behavior as much higher evidence um, than the existence of nociceptors alone. So we can then also look at the real power of markers come when they cluster in this related way when you have, say, both nociceptors and this responsiveness to analgesics and an integrated brain um, that's taking, um, taking signals from the nociceptors. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the kind of the short end of that little story is that there really are no defeaters when it comes to markers. There are no negative <laughs> derived markers. There's no thing that we can point to and say, well, that's evidence that this thing isn't conscious. 
So if we've got an entity that lacks all initial markers, something like um, a copy of On the Origin of Species, right? Then we're not going to be asking, oh, is this is this book conscious, right? We don't even ask that question of that system. Um, but when we look at an entity that has some initial markers, if it has some behavioral flexibility, if it has some social interaction, if it has some um, goal, something that looks like goal-directed behavior, then they become a candidate for a marker approach. And that entities that have some um, initial markers, but they lack any of these derived markers, and none of the scientific evidence uh, exists for, for uh, uh, like adding additional markers to describe them, then our whatever our starting credence level should just remain unchanged. So with plants, maybe we don't, we were like, okay, it's very low. I don't really have any scientific evidence. So I'm just going to be like, maybe plants, but probably not. I'm not going to worry too much about the plants, maybe. Um, but if we have derived markers and our credence levels go up, this is because defeaters require theory, which we lack. But we have a lot of positive tests. We don't have defeaters, but we have a lot of these kind of um, ways of raising our credence level. Pain experience is just one kind of sentience. Sensing temperature is another kind of sentience. Feeling hunger is another kind of sentience. And then we can go outside of kind of mere sentience and look at kind of rational thought. We can look at self-reflective self-consciousness. We can look at perception. We can look at memory. We can look in lots of different domains and look for markers for all of these different things. And we could look at sleep patterns, for example. So we can turn to the hydra, um, which is one of the simplest of all animals. Um, they have the simplest body plan of the synodarians. They only have two cell layers, um, but they sleep in ways that are remarkably similar to mammalian sleep. Um, and so we've got, if sleep is a marker of consciousness, as the Cambridge Declaration would have it, then whatever your initial credence level was of consciousness in the hydra, a very simple animal, the marker methodology would have you raise that credence level a little bit. Um, so what we could do at this point is we could say, oh gosh, guess what? Hydra are conscious or nematode worms are conscious. And you might think that that's what I'm saying we should do, given my title. Oh no, I had a different title. Given the title I have the paper this talk is based on, which is in quotes, all animals are conscious. Um, but I don't think we can do that. I think that what this marker methodology gives us is an illusion of progress on the distribution question, because the method that the theory light um, methodology gives us is one that can only increase confidence. It can never decrease confidence. Um, there are no negative derived markers. We can never completely lose markers, but can only lower their evidential value. And the number of evidential markers for each type of consciousness should be expected to increase with further research. So we should predict that as the science increases, as we start asking more and more questions about more and more different animals, about more and more different kinds of consciousness, um, we will gain more evidence of their consciousness. Um, so this is a real limitation of the theory light approach. It can only increase evidence in animal sentience. Uh, and what does it do about AI sentience? It does nothing for the gaming problem. The gaming problem as I described it, yeah, you just still could have this kludgy Frankenstein. We don't know what consciousness is. Um, so where does this leave us, right? We have the theory heavy approaches. We don't have any good theories. The theory light approaches, which just are gonna make us say all animals are conscious um, and tell us absolutely nothing about the AIs. And then these direct perception approaches, which don't even work. Should we give up? Um, I don't think so. I think what we really need to do is redouble our efforts in finding theory, finding a secure theory. How are you gonna answer questions about both a non-evolved computer system and a nematode worm? you're gonna to have to know what you're asking about. You're gonna to have to give me a definition of consciousness. I'm gonna to have to give you a definition of consciousness. We are gonna to have to know what we're talking about. We're gonna to have to figure this out. And in order to figure this out, I think that we need to switch our attention from the distribution question, which we are not in a position to answer and turn our attention more to the dimensions question. In what ways are other systems conscious? And as we turn our attention to the dimensions question, what we should do as a working hypothesis is accept that all animals are conscious, even sponges, even the hydra, even the nematode worm. 
These are all systems that behave, that we have already set, set methodologies for studying their behavior. You might ask, why not study plants as well? Why not fungi? If we had ways of studying their behavior, that might be really productive in the science as well. As far as I know, we don't have uh, good methods for studying plant behavior. And if we do, great, plants are fine too. I'm not saying anything about bad about plants. But what we can do in the neuroscience of consciousness is start by looking at animals that aren't just monkeys and humans and a couple of rats. We can start looking at animals that are already intensively studied, such as nematode worms, and study what, um, what sort of physiological effects are going on when they're producing behaviors that, we, that are taken to be markers of consciousness. And so I've got, I'm just going to end with two brief kind of arguments to support this methodological suggestion I have. Um, there's a pragmatic argument that premising uh, animal consciousness makes existing research more fecund. If we premise that the animals that we're working with are conscious, then it increases the number of topics that can be studied. For one thing, you can ask questions about episodic memory instead of episodic-like me memory. If episodic memory involves consciousness and episodic like memory doesn't, this is the, the traditional, the way it's normally handled in comparative psychology right now. I think we can also better recognize the kind of relevant variables that might affect an animal's behavior if we think, oh, yeah, maybe they had a bad dream <laughs> or maybe they don't like this person who's handling them and that's why they're not behaving this way. It'll allow us to see that if we treat our research subjects as, as conscious beings. Uh, it can also help us create better eliciting conditions in experimental contexts if we start to think about the animals from the animal's own perspective. Uh, and I think that we see this in some of the really clever experiments that Christopher Krupenye and colleagues have done with, with chimpanzees to elicit uh, theory of mind behavior out of chimpanzees after 40 years of researchers trying to do this and failing to do it. He was thinking, oh, what, what did chimpanzees care about? Um, what, what really, what gets them excited? So, so thinking about them as agents with conscious experience. Uh, and importantly, if we treat, uh, if we do this kind of research with non-human animals and we treat them as if they're conscious um, and we do have these kind of effects that, that I'm suggesting here and have more data and then ask more questions, I think then we're going to have a much, be much better positioned to make claims about continuity and discontinuity between humans and other animals. Lots of people are making discontinuity claims, claims about human uniqueness. But when we're not even studying non-human animals the same way we're studying human animals, um, I think that these claims are not justified by the kind of science that's happening. I also think there's better ethical outcomes if you're treating your research subjects as, as if they're conscious. The other argument for premising animals, uh, research subjects as conscious is uh, what I call the studying simplicity argument. So if we take uh, simpler models and study simpler models, then we are going to be less distracted by the irrelevant variables that we see in the more elaborated uh, models. So humans are very elaborated, weird kinds of beings. We do use language, for example. It can be very easy to be distracted by our language because I'm, I'm sorry, I should stop talking. I use it a lot. We use it a lot. We see it in each other. Um, and if we can set aside these kind of variables uh, and not get distracted by them, then uh, the hope is that we can make better progress. We can also piggyback on a lot of existing research on uh, simple invertebrates. I shouldn't say simple, I take it back, on invertebrate animals. Um, we've got, a, you know, I don't know how many of millions or billions of C. elegans and Drosophila in research labs. Uh, across the world, and these animals could also be used for studying consciousness. Um, the goal then is to develop paradigms that could be used with a number of species across labs and communicate this really effectively to people in these different labs so that when they've got a student who needs a project and they're like, oh, here, do this, do this consciousness project on our flies. Um, the challenge though, is that we have to keep in mind that these animals that we're studying are not like little flying humans or little wormy humans, that there are a variety of different sorts of sensory systems of interest and so on and so forth. And so this is where the dimensions question, I'll see what you mean, yeah, this slide. 
where we, why we really need to turn to this final question, the dimensions question, in order to make progress on, um, uh, on developing a scientific theory. So we can ask questions like, what are, um, how rich are the perceptual experiences of different animals? Um, how rich are their evaluative experiences? What are the qualities of their memory capacities? What are their capacities for thinking about themselves? What kind of agency do they have? Um, and these are proposals that Jonathan Birch, Nikki Clayton and collaborators and um, Albert Nguyen and collaborators have argued for with different sorts of, you can't really see what those are, but like different dimensions of consciousness in, in um, cognitive sensory systems. So we can get at what's different while we're also asking what's the same when it comes to is there consciousness and but what kind of consciousness is there? So this is my last slide. I think that we've got a lot of benefits of premising animal consciousness um, that we can uh, that uh, lead us to really take this this proposal seriously. Um, and that is that if we can presume animals are conscious and it does allow us to study very simple systems, which will allow us to make progress on a theory question, then we can use that theory to apply it to uh, questions about chat GPT and really get at the answer to that question, which none of these other methods were uh, allowing us to do. So thank you for your attention. And I look forward to discussion after the break.